welcome back to the Electric Bastion and Deep Dive with me, Chris McDowell, here on Bastion Land Broadcasting. And we're going to go straight into it because today is hopefully the last of the deep dives. We've been working our way through at a very mixed pace. Some weeks we've really smashed through huge sections of the book and some weeks we've um, really dwelled on things and gone into a proper deep dive on specific little sections of the book. But we are through the entire sort of main content of the book now. All that we have left is the Oddendum. Um, continuing in the grand tradition of the two books that I've put out of having a stupid pun for the last section of the book. So in Into the Odd, we had the Oddpendium, which was a selection of random tables, a lot of D100 tables, things like that for like names. There was a table for I eat the stuff and there was a table for I push the red button and it was just silly little random tables. Um, but I had lots of random tables already in this book so I didn't want to just do another version of that. Um, and it was actually something that someone suggested to me which I was originally a little bit resistant to was the idea of tidying up some of the stuff from the blog and putting that in the book. Because I always think, I don't want to just like, I don't want to make people pay for the stuff that's on the blog for free because it's it's on the blog for free for a reason. And my uh, Patreon supporters, you know, they pay for the blog, but it's that's done on the understanding that the content is going to be free to everyone. So a lot of this stuff that's in the Oddendum is still free on the blog at bastionland.com. But, you know, some people like having it in paper form and um, being able to reference it at the table and sit down and sort of digest it in a bit more detail, perhaps, than they would sat at their screen. So I, de I decided to allow it. It's only sort of, how many pages? We're on 291. And how long is the book? I should know this by now. Um, the page is like 336. So you've got like 40 pages out of 330. So... 12 15% of your book um so yeah I, I don't feel too bad about <laughs> some content in here also being available on the blog so I will just read the little blurb here I'm not going to read everything out what, the actual articles that are in here some of them kind of speak themselves but some of them I can explain a little bit about why I thought they deserved to be in the book um so bastion land sprawls beyond even the reach of this book it cannot be contained. The first half of this chapter is a series of articles offering further explanation of how to run the game and understand the setting. They are not essential, but may offer clarity or inspiration. The first piece is intended for players and the remaining for the conductor or anybody seeking to understand the world. The second half contains sample content that is apocryphal and may have no place in your world. They're the type of thing I like to put in my own version of Bastionland and while they are free to be used whole cloth, they are intended to illustrate how you can expand your own vision of Bastion Land. If you have an idea, no matter how strange, you can find a place for it in Bastion Land. So it's kind of lead by example, this whole is the philosophy behind this section. Because again, I really didn't want to have a sort of library content of canonical things in the world so i didn't want to have like a monster section that is like these are the monsters of bastion land or uh, locations and it's like these are the the main landmarks of bastion are here written in stone instead i just wanted to say like look this is the stuff that i come up with for my games at home that i run because i you know this is the game that i run most of the time when i run an rpg frankly so it's it's, it's intended to serve as an example one thing that I am especially happy with, and I normally like to give Alec, who did all the illustrations for this book, I normally like to give him like loads of credit. Um, let's just get full screen here. Um, I normally like to give him a lot of credit for his artwork, but because this is the last episode on the deep dive, I'm not going to give Alec any credit. Um, I'm going to take all the credit for this piece here because I did this collage here you know it's it's one thing to be able to draw all these evocative images but what takes the real talent is going into MS Paint 
and clipping all of the signs and a dog and some stars into a collage because you had a spare page at the start of each chapter and you hadn't commissioned any artwork to go there. Um, so originally the collages started as a very practical idea of like, shit, I haven't got enough artwork here. Alec is going to be like up against the clock anyway to finish the artwork that we've got. I don't want to ask him for, you know, four more full page pieces. Um, I will just do a collage. But I think they came out pretty good. <laughs> I know they look quite rough and, you know, they genuinely were made in, in MS Paint. But I like that they each of these collages highlight something different. And this one is, yeah, it's, it's the sort of miscellany of Bastion. Because it's the miscellaneous section. So you've got a pie with a gun in it and lots of posters and signs. So let's go into the addendum. Oh, before we go in. I asked on Twitter today if anybody had any questions um, about the book because this is the last of the deep dives. I'm going to try and answer as many questions as I can. Um, I've got a couple from Twitter that I've got ready to go. Um, we are apparently operating on a bit of a delay um, here, which is a bit of a pain. But if you do have any questions, just fire them out and then I will try and get to them as soon as I can once we sort of catch up with the delay. So this is was an absolute no-brainer to be the first pay, first article in the addendum. In fact, I almost put it at the start of the book because it's the one piece of writing here that is catered for the players. So when I wrote this on the blog, it ended up being really popular and it's based on a few posts. I can't remember the source now, but I saw a few people posting kind of like a, the idea of having a guide for players. Um, there's so much, um, so much focus put on GM advice and how to run the game, but you don't often see how to play the game in the same way. How to play the game normally means how the rules work, but I actually wanted something of a strategy guide and it kind of, it's a little bit tongue in cheek because Electric Bastionan isn't like a hyper competitive tournament level game where you would actually have a strategy guide. But it just to get players into the mind of thinking like, yeah, I've got, I've got to be clever about this. And just things that might sound obvious if you played a lot of especially OSR style games where it's like, um, you know, ask questions about your environment. Like, because if you haven't played an RPG before, you might not know that you can do these things. It sounds really obvious. But you might not realize that you can talk to people instead of fighting them and you might not realize that you can try and sneak past people and you know you, you you might need it reinforcing that these are probably better than fighting like if you can talk someone around that's kind of the best case scenario because you've you've got past the obstacle without any without having to sneak by without any risk you've just spoken to them and that can get results um so yeah this was a really easy decision to have this there um for the artwork here i think i basically said for the for the pieces for the addendum i said to alec do whatever you want <laughs> which is um got some nice nice results so electric bastion and its oddities That is not uh, what I intended to do. Here we go. So Electric Bastion and its oddities. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all these articles, but I just want to explain why they were in here because I wanted to have... Oddities are such a key part of the game. I wanted to have a, a guide for creating them in here. So they are mentioned earlier in the book and they're given the kind of three bullet point treatment. But I think they do kind of warrant a bit more explanation because they're tricky to get right. They're, they're probably one of the hardest things in the game, creating oddities in some ways. Um, in many ways, they're more difficult than like making a D&D spell. Because in D&D, you've got so much mechanical stuff you can lean on. And everything is set in levels. And, you know, magic users are restricted how many times they can use different spells per day. So if you make... A spell a sixth level spell you know that it's only going to be used in certain ways but with an oddity by their nature 
one of the changes from Into the Odd is that they just work. You're never going to need to make like a, a roll to have it happen. Um, so you've got to you've got to balance it, and balance is not a dirty word in this case. Um, a lot of people think, you know, when you talk about balance, that you're talking about balanced encounters and designing situations where the players should statistically win with a bit of a challenge. It's not about that. For me, balance is about making sure that interesting decisions stay a part of the game. So I'm not interested in balancing monsters so that they will almost certainly been, be defeated by the players. Instead, what I want to do is I want to balance things so that you don't just find one oddity and that's your solution to every problem now. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's some kind of blunt force solutions here, like making it an oddity disposable where it's just one use. That's like an easy one if you just want to make something absolutely bonkers. Um, give it a limited number of uses. So if you saw the actual play on Sunday, um, Alan Girding rolled up his character and he got the gutter minder, so failed career number one. And he got the wish tonic as his item he was hiding under his under his rags. So the wish tonic is exactly what it sounds like. It, it you got three of them. You got three wishes basically. Each time you take a swig of this tonic, you can make a wish, and it happens every single time but it only lasts as long as the kick of the the liquor so like d6 turns it says and i can use this for some absolutely bonkers stuff and um i'm at, at the time i was like alan what are you doing to me this is my first like live stream of a game and you're throwing some crazy wishes at me but it worked um because it's got that limitation where after d6 turns everything snaps back to how it was and you know it's it is bonkers and it is overpowered by any measure but you only get three of them and once they're gone they're gone so in a one shot obviously they're going to use them pretty uh, wildly but but yeah it, it's it's an easy solution um random chance of depletion on each use i don't like that so much um i like one of my favorites is if you've got an oddity that you think is too powerful make it a creature so make it intelligent and give it its own agenda so it's incredibly powerful but it's not necessarily going to help you all the time um and yeah there's just a bit of explanation there about the tech level of the game because it is something that it's when i wrote this i didn't have all this artwork and stuff so like i feel like the artwork gets the setting across much better than any essay can but i did decide to leave this in so uh, let me just hide myself so we can see the full side here. But yeah, it talks about how early 20th century, but it's not alternate history. So you can you can pull things from like the era of World War Two, Second World War, and but you don't have to have you don't have to have the Second World War. You can have flamethrowers and mortars, but you don't have to take everything else that comes with that. And yeah, so before I go on to the next one, I've got a quick question from Svon Raider. Um, have you any insight for a conductor who is play uh, for a conductor who has players who are getting a bit too good at playing OSR challenges? So if your players are getting too good, so like they're if they're not feeling challenged by the challenges that you're throwing at them. Hmm. I mean, the obvious answer is like make the challenges more difficult. Um, but I don't know if that's like, that's not very useful. Um, if you want to make things more difficult for the players, there's a blog post I wrote about this. Um, let me see if I can get it because it's something that when I wrote it, I thought, it, it was not long after the book was released. I'm just going to find it for you now. Um, it was not long after the book was released that I wrote this article. Here we go. Called Cheap Tricks. And it's a shame. Well, it was it was a good while after the book was released. Actually, 9th of April, the book was in print by then, I think. Um, and it's a shame because there's some useful stuff in here. Um so it's basically like little tricks to make things, to little tricks to uh, 
change your game. So if you want to make the players feel good, little things you can do that make them feel good. Um, cheap failure tricks. So when I say cheap, I don't mean like they're unfair. I mean cheap as in like this isn't some groundbreaking GM advice. This is just like a little tip. Um, there's some interesting stuff in here that might help you like apply extra pressure to them. So when they do fail, you can make it a more interesting type of failure. Um, and horror, yeah, just make things more horrible. So if they're getting too good, make some of the challenges really horrific and make them scared again. Yeah. Um, and that's called Cheap Tricks. If you go on bastionhand.com, you can read that entire article. Um, people are everything. And this was very much inspired by living in a big city. So I live in Manchester in the UK. At the moment, we are in, what date is it? It's the start of June. And I'm actually starting to miss the crowds because obviously we are on lockdown still. Um, but Manchester city centre is a very busy place. It's a very big city. Um, I travel to London occasionally for, uh, well, with my previous job. And that's obviously even more people. And this is the closest we get to having swearing in the book. Uh, if you frequent a big city, you'll know that all the buildings and cars and pigeons are nothing in comparison to all the bloody people. And then if you imagine it on bastion scale, it because when, when you describe me a city, I don't know if this is just me, but it's very easy to get into describing the, you think of a city, so you're thinking buildings and streets and roads. But normally, if you're in a city, there's just people everywhere and the people are part of the scenery and the people are part of what makes that city what it is. And it's not even necessarily the NPCs, like the individual character of an NPC is part of it, but then you've also got just people as in like an element almost, like smoke or fog, just people everywhere. And um, crowds behave very differently to individuals. And I wanted to sort of get that across in here, sort of, it basically the gimmick of this post was can everything be people so can armor be people yeah it's like a lackey can um a mercenary oh no yeah can, can you change anything into people so i said like an avalanche make it a riot um instead of a weapon make it a mercenary um any plan that you've got there are three people in the way so it's kind of a bit excessive but it's it's hammering the point home of like people are bastion is people Decisive combat is another one that I see getting linked around a lot and I'm very glad I was able to put it in the book because it, I had so many questions from Into the Odd from people, from people, yeah, I had so many questions from people about Into the Odd, specifically how the combat works and how the um, always hit combat is a little bit of a misnomer, but the idea that you don't roll to hit, you just roll damage and you're always taking damage when you're in combat for the most part. Um, so having an article explain that was a big relief because hopefully before people ask me about it now, they'll read this and it will explain how it works and why it's that way more importantly. Let me just hide myself while I take a quick drink of this. I'm very, I'll come back in a second and explain why. So across doing these streams, I've noticed a few things about myself, which are very unpleasant. One is that I drink really loudly and it's, it's, it's exaggerated when I'm sat this close to a microphone just here. So I'm going to do my best to mute myself when I'm drinking. Um, and I have to apologize on the actual play. I was wearing headphones so that I could hear Sean and Alan. So what did I do? I proceeded to yell everything at the top of my voice, like, a comedy person wearing headphones so i apologize that i am blaring across the uh, audio while um sean and alan are a bit more restrained or at least as restrained as alan ever is um so yeah that's the size of combat the ici doctrine is is an expansion of something that i mentioned earlier on it is a little bit of repetition but it's something that i think bears repeating i've i've harped on about this before um if you, 
it, it's another one of these things where I've slightly exaggerated it and I've gone perhaps over the line of what I would actually do at the table just to get across the point. And it's, it's a little bit hyperbolic. And I think obviously information, yes, give lots of information. That doesn't mean that you can't have any secrets from your players. It doesn't mean that you have to tell them absolutely everything and overload them with information. But it, I, I so often see things go the other way where the players don't have enough information about a choice so they can't make an informed choice. Whether that's to take a risk or decide between two things. They haven't got enough information so that it kind of becomes a bit of a meaningless choice. The classic example is you're in a dungeon it branches off to the left and the right. There's a door to your left and a door to your right. Which way do you go? So even if you just tell them about something they can hear behind one of the doors, before they even ask, just say, so it splits in two directions. To the left, there's a door and there's sound of loud machinery behind it. And the pathway to your right, there's a door and it's absolutely silent down that way. It gives them something to make the choice. It becomes a choice. It's not just flipping a coin. And I've sort of gone into more detail here, informed danger and death. Um, the one thing I will say about this page is I love that art. Both pieces here, you can enjoy that in its full glory. Um, so one, of, I'll come back to this, but one of the questions that I had on Twitter, and I'm going to find who asked it now so I can actually credit them properly. I think I know who it was, but I don't want to... Uh, don't want to misquote anybody. Um, duh, duh, duh. So Benjamin Foster um, on Twitter asked me, what part of creating Electric Bastion Land, be it how a mechanic turned out or a part of the world or something in playtesting, etc., what part really surprised you? Um, so there are a few answers to this. There is a really boring answer there's a kind of middling answer and then there's perhaps a more interesting one. So the most boring answer is that the thing that surprised me most is how long it takes to get the last like 1% of the book done. So if you're filling up the bar of the book being from 0% when it's an idea up to 100% when it's, you know, on the, shop, in, the in the warehouse being distributed. Uh, the first 50% does take a long time, but it's kind of like steady pro progress. And then it slows down as you kind of finish it up. But the last, the last, like last few hurdles of just getting the thing ready for print, the final editing and the final proofreading and all of those little tiny things, it, it's, it's past the point where you feel like it was done. So I had like a printed version that I did myself on the shelf for like almost two years, I think. No, 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 that's not true. For like uh, over a year. Um, where it was kind of done enough that I could show it to people. It didn't have artwork, but just there was a lot of messing around with Kickstarter and so on. So it's that last bit of the project where it goes from being a book that I can print myself to a book that I can actually send to people. It takes a lot longer than you'd think. Uh, the, the answer that's more interesting that I perhaps I've already mentioned quite a lot during this process is the artwork. What surprised me about it is how how different it looks to what I was expecting, but how well it fits. So it's a different take on Bastion Land to how I was imagining it, but it looks brilliant and I now can't imagine it any other way. Um, and I say this as we've got one of my favorite pieces on here because yeah, it's just, it's just bonkers. Like I, I, none of this came from me, this piece. I didn't say to, to Alec, can I have, this woman with a, a bloody sledgehammer dressed in a, is it like a rabbit mask and like a cloak? Like, no, that is entirely came from him. So, um, and yet, and yet it fits perfectly with the feel of Bastion. So that's the kind of slightly more interesting one. Um, in terms of what surprised me about the final, about the actual, the, the setting is let me think how I'm phrasing this. Um, 
I think I'm surprised how. I'm not, I'm not surprised by it, but like, it, I always wanted people to be able to take the setting and run with it on their own. But I'm always really surprised when I see on Twitter or on the blog or on the YouTube comments somebody talking about the setting in a real fond way because I just. A little part of me always thought people are going to take this book and, you know, I was pretty happy with the rule system. So I was like, people might use this like, like rules like system and they'll use, maybe they'll use the failed careers, but they're going to probably, a little part of me was always thinking they're going to try and run D&D &D with it. They're going to want to put orcs back in it and dragons and stuff. Um, but I'm all, I'm still massively overwhelmed when I see people coming up with new ideas that just fit in Bastion Land. And I know that sounds ridiculous because I spent ages writing this book about Bastion Land, trying to explain to people how to make your own stuff and put it in Bastion Land. So people are just doing what I've been hoping they would, but I'm surprised at how passionately some people are doing that. And it's an amazing feeling. Uh, big impact. This is another one that uh, I wrote this pretty recently after Into the Odd came out. Um, is this the one where there's a typo that made it through? No, I think I think there's one reference in the book somewhere to willpower that slipped through the net. No, no, I think you know what I think I think I got it on the second pass of uh, proofreading after the first PDF came out. But yeah, this this came out pretty pretty soon after Into the Art originally came out because there are a few things in the book where monsters or oddities or things just felt a bit weak. And I'd always rather make things too impactful than too weak. It can sometimes be a double-edged sword where the impact is much higher than people are expecting, but this is why the information is so key. If you give people enough information, then they're not surprised when they get hit with a big impact. So the, the example that I've, I've used multiple times is this transformer needle. This is the kind of thing you'd see in like a D&D &D book. You'd, get, you'd, let, you'd have the player make a save to avoid the attack and then they make a save to avoid the effect of the attack and even if they fail that they get like two more attempts to save otherwise the horrible thing happens to them and in like fifth edition this is how like death saves work isn't it so if you're going to die you've got to fail a number of saves really to die but that's not what i wanted i wanted if if i'm going to put this transformer needle in that turns you into a fish i want there to be a good chance that one of you is going to get turned into a fish unless you're careful about it um so yeah you're going to lose strength straight away and you're going to turn into a fish at zero strength and you're going to start to pick up fish fishy traits straight away make the thing do the thing is the the dumb way of explaining it that i try and remember for myself like don't be afraid to have it do what it's meant to do ah oof. so this is a big topic here um this this is such a big topic that i'm gonna Need another swig of this drink. Alcohol-free drink this week. We're not doing cocktails again. That was a bad idea. Um, it was... <laughs> if I've learned one thing from doing the cocktails last week and doing the stream on Sundays, it's that I, I, I'm, re I'm still really bad at multi multitasking. So doing a, a cocktail stream simultaneously with a RPG design stream is, is difficult. So uh, And running a stream for other people is also difficult while I'm trying to run a game so foreground growth and active survival are two terms that i threw around on the blog a while back just to try and it, they're, they're still work in progress really and i know that sounds ridiculous because the book is now out and on your shelves but I, i've i've followed these philosophies with Electric Bastion Land, but I do think I could go further in the future with other things. Um, some of it was inspired by something that Arnold Kemp wrote on Goblin Punch about how one of the cool things about wizards in D&D &D is that in early editions, they didn't automatically get new spells as they leveled up. I don't know which versions, but I'm going to say in BX, let's say, in Home's Basic, I think, um, you didn't automatically get spells when you log when you leveled up. So you, you level up to level two as wizard, you don't gain any new spells. You can cast higher levels of spell, but to get those spells, you've got to go out and find them. Now, 
the boring way to do this is you have a game where there's like a magic shop and you go to the magic shop and buy your new spell of fireball but a more interesting way is that you have to like raid a wizard's tower or find a wizard that will teach you the spell and that's foreground growth because that's stuff that's happening in the game and part of that was why i tied all these abilities to like oddities so even back in electro bastion and i was kind of doing this without knowing what i was going to call it um but i wanted everything that you gained in the game or even negative things that persisted i wanted you to be able to look back and say where they came from in the game um so yeah it's not growth isn't something that happens between sessions it's something that happens in the game so to give you an example in the actual play that i ran on sunday uh, alan's character um got a battle scar from a harpoon gun that was shot by this weird monster thing um and as a result he gained more hp so now when he looks at his hp and he's got six hp now instead of the one he starts with he can remember that this was as a result of him barely surviving this um barely surviving this attack and similarly later in the game he actually got a second scar there was there was a, there were a lot of scars rolled uh, in that game and when he got his second scar he got a punctured lung um, and if he gets that punctured lung fixed then he would gain more hp as well so he could sort of he would if he got that fixed by a doctor he would have quite a high amount of hp for a new character but he'd have these persisting injuries that are sort of a reminder of where they came from and there are some other ways in here explaining how to do that but I, I do feel like i could go further with it but it's it's how i wanted growth to happen in the game and again it's growth it's not advancement you're not advancing towards level 20 where you win the game and you're not necessarily advancing towards being more powerful you probably will get more powerful and more options but it's growth so it's going to be messy and weird again i use the example of a going through your teenage years it's messy and you're going to come out hopefully better but it's going to be a bumpy ride and active survival kind of links to that but it's the idea that you don't just get more hp um you don't just get better at surviving because you're now level eight um you also have to have you also have to learn to survive to actively survive and then Cities and Adventures Light was just like a bit of a silly kind of almost poem, I guess, that I wrote. Rant is probably better. Uh, G Vico, hi, what system? Uh, so I'm assuming you've stumbled into here from Twitch. Um, this is a game called Electric Bastion Land. Uh, this is the last part of the deep dive into it. And if you go to bastionland.com, you can read all about it. Uh, why Conductor? So this was one of the last changes I made to the game. Um, I think I spoke about it before that I previously used referee and that's fine and I didn't want to use game master wherever possible I want to use the the easy phrase that people already know so HP even though it's not perfect I still used HP even if I was saying it was hit protection instead of hit points strength dexterity charisma I kind of wanted to rename them, but I felt like I was renaming it for the sake of it. So I wanted to keep the kind of lingua franca of D and D, if you like. Um, same with terms like damage. It's it's if there's a term that already exists, I would rather use that term than try and invent something new. But I allowed myself one indulgence, which is conductor, because I just don't like I don't like hate the term game master, but you know if I'm writing a book and I want to believe in the words that I'm using. So I don't mind strength, dexterity, charisma. They're fine. I don't mind HP. But Game Master, I just, I didn't want it to be in there because it it, it kind of, it's a bit too hierarchical. hierarchical. Um, it's a bit, there's a bit too much hierarchy implied, let's say. Um, and of course, the person that's running the game has a certain element of extra power and responsibility over what's going on. But I wanted it to be something that was a bit more, a bit impartial as well, which is why I previously used referee. Um, but referee also just sounds so boring. Like, who wants to be the referee? Like, 
if people don't know what that involves, like if we were going to go play football and you said, right, us three are going to be red shirts, those three are going to be blue shirts, and you can be the referee, I would feel like I've drawn the short straw. But conductor in an orchestra or a conductor in a circuit, it's useful. People might want to be the conductor of an orchestra. Um, so yeah, it's a bit silly, but I have come around to really liking it, and I think it fits. I'm not going to suggest that anyone uses it for any other games. Uh, I'm going to say that it's a it's a it's a nice little Bastionland thing that we can keep just for Bastionland. The conductor is a game designer. So if you're going to run a role playing game, the two options are you find a system that has an answer for everything. You find something like Pathfinder where there's a, a rule for everything. And then if you find something that there isn't a rule for, you either panic and just kind of rush through it. Or you go on Twitter and you ask the official questions account. Um, how do I, what happens when a player tries to carry two shields at once and a dagger in each hand? What, what, how do I do that? Um, that's one way of doing it. Or you, you pick up a little bit of game design and then the system doesn't need to have everything because sooner or later you are going to hit a situation where you need to make a little ruling or you need to, or you, or you want to create a new little system for something like a little silly mini game almost within the game. And this is almost definitely going to happen. It might only happen once in a campaign, but if it happens once in a campaign after eight sessions of running Pathfinder, you might struggle to adjudicate it because it's the first time you've done it. But if you're running Electric Bastion and you're probably going to have to do it quite regularly, sort of make these judgment calls. So this is just a little guide of how to do that because I, I want the conductor to be able to do that with confidence and then they don't have to worry about it happening. Traps. I will get to traps right after answering this question. Oh, J.R. Sison. I'm assuming that's Jonathan. Um, whenever I run Electric Bastion Land, the setting always ends up quite comedic. Silly bureaucracy, over-the-top characters, quirky monsters. How do you manage the tone of Bastion to keep the eclectic character of the setting without getting too silly? You're probably unfortunate in the sense that you've had me run the game and I lean towards it being slightly silly. Even when I try really hard, I mean, in the actual play on Sunday, I, I felt like I was being a straight man for once because Sean and Alan were taking the piss um, in a good way. Um, I think it's, it, it's about doing what works for your table. So I tend to lean towards things being a bit silly and over the top because I tend to run more one shots and short campaigns. Um, so I think with those, it, it sometimes I find with with like a one shot, it's quite difficult to get it to have much um, gravitas because it's it's kind of a bit ephemeral and it's like watching a you know a three minute cartoon to some extent rather than watching a film. Um, I think I think it depends on the person running the game, which I realise is like the ultimate cop out, but I think I, I what I've tried to do in here is. There are, there are some silly jokes, like there's no, I'm not going to lie, there are some silly jokes in this book, but for the most part, it is kind of played straight and it's played with the world is serious. The world isn't, it's not Discworld where the world is like built as a joke almost. And that's not, that's not at all a disservice to Discworld. Um, Discworld has its very serious elements. Um, in fact, I believe it's a, it's a quote from Terry Pratchett saying that something to the effect of um, funny isn't the opposite of serious, which is a fair point. But what I mean is it's, it's, it's kind of built as a pastiche of a, of a fantasy setting and there are lots of very on the nose jokes. Whereas here I've tried to, I think, I think you could run it relatively straight. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump back. Like, ugh, this is a bad example. Mockeries, yes, you could run mockeries quite straight, even though they are clearly Muppets. There's nothing in here that says, like, oh, yeah, run him like Fozzy Bear. Like, you could run this quite seriously if you wanted to. Um, 
and there's some there's little bits of darkness that you can kind of tap into. So they act human, but their needs are only imitated. There's there's some dark implication there that they they're like imitating the needs of a real life form, and um, you know they are excellent but unconventional teachers of their talent. You could take that in a dark direction, um, and the fact that real animals hate them it suggests something a bit unnatural. So you could, I think you could run it straight or you could run it silly, but it's it's right on the cusp and whichever way you push, it's gonna go in that direction. Traps. This was another one that I, this was actually not too far before I started writing the book. No, well, it was after I started writing the book, but. It, it was quite close to publication when I added this in. Um, and I'm glad that I did because I love traps and I love good traps. But a bad trap is even worse than a bad monster. Like a bad monster, it's like a bad pizza. It's probably fine. You'll probably have some fun. There are very good monsters that are better, but like it's, it's hard to make like a really awful monster. But traps can be absolutely abysmal bad traps is like a bad if if a bad monster is like bad pizza um bad traps are like bad mushrooms like i love mushrooms when they're nicely cooked and nicely seasoned and warm but a cold mushroom or a tinned mushroom a tinned watery mushroom on a cooked breakfast cold is enough to almost ruin the entire plate um so yeah, traps and mushrooms is what I'm saying. So the key takeaway from this is I like traps that create a choice. And one of the things that I put in into the odd that people really latched onto was have traps be announced. So don't hide them. Don't have a pit trap where the players are walking down and you say, yes, there's a corridor ahead of you. And they say, I walk down the corridor and they walk down there and then you say, a pit trap opens, make a save. And two of them make the save, two of them fail it. And the two fall down, take 3d8 damage, and one of them dies. That's not a good trap from a game point of view. It's an excellent trap from a stopping people coming into your castle point of view. But as I've said time and time again, the setting should serve the game. And if that means there are no perfect traps in this setting, then that's fine. Because I don't want my game to have those rubbish pit traps that just open up and kill you out of nowhere so i've gone into a bit more detail explaining what i mean when i say that the trap should announce itself so it doesn't have to be an open pit so it could be a concealed pit that rather than falling down into onto spikes that kill you you just fall into piranha filled water so you've got a bit of ta a bit of chance to respond there's a moment between when the trap springs and or rather when the trap announces itself and when you suffer the effects of the trap, there's a moment where you can make a choice. And yeah, you're, you're up to your neck in piranha-filled water, but you can make a choice. They can still be deadly, they can still be harsh, but there needs to be a choice there, even if it's a difficult choice. Expose your prep is another sort of uh, taking that to the next level where, let me hide myself so we can see this one. Um, so yeah, it's one thing to say, make your traps visible, but why not make everything visible? And it's kind of a, it's kind of a bit of a silly thought experiment here. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever actually exposed my encounter table to the players, but, but why not? Next time you're making a dungeon, why not have something in the dungeon, somebody that lives there? that knows the dungeon and they can explain to you, look, here is what is roaming the halls. You've got six different encounters and they're going to tell you about every single one of them. Reward them with information if, they, if they've if they managed to get that information out of that character and, you know, show them the table. And this was inspired by, again, a post from Arnold Kemp on Goblin Punch who gets more credit on this bloody book than Alec does, I think, in some cases. Um, if you don't read Goblin Punch, 
it is extremely useful blog and the attack every part of the character sheet phrase i forget what the name of the post was but if you search for that you'll find it um is a very similar sort of idea to this where it's like can you have a monster that attacks your alignment or your um, encumbrance or things like that it's just an interesting sort of interesting sort of thought experiment um small tables i'm, I'm not going to go into that because it kind of explains itself if you go and read it balancing ah this is what i was harping on about earlier balancing isn't about making things equal it's about preserving interesting choices yeah exactly so a little bit of repetition here dare i say <laughs> how to balance oddities um giant ants again giant ants is a thing from um from a, a, an arnold kemp post i think where he spoke about giant ants and um explained why they are difficult to use well as written in the dnd sort of old dnd editions and he's got a very good post on giant ants and making them interesting that's the last time i'm going to recommend anything from arnold kemp today he's had quite enough um, noble weapons just getting across the idea that just because in the equipment list you've got a very broad categories of weapons like field weapons simple weapons hand weapons i forget what they were even called oh here we go hand weapons field weapons and heavy guns and noble weapons there are only four types of weapon in into the odd um just because there's only four doesn't mean that they all have to be the same so can you make 12 noble weapons that all feel different yeah but again, this is like an example of what you can do. So this isn't the definitive the definitive list of noble weapons in Electric Bastion Land. This is just an example of how you could do that. Unions and rituals. So unions for a little while were gonna be a much bigger thing in the book. Um, almost like mini classes where you join a union and you can sort of perform rituals with them but then you have to like give something back in return so there's a couple here and in fact these are these things the master phages and the tin soldiers i believe they both appear as debt holders earlier on in the book that you may end up owing money to but here they are sort of organizations that you can join and they let you do weird things basically but it didn't quite make the cut as like being core content this is just like additional stuff and again it's just to show that like if you want to come up with your own ideas for these don't wait for me to tell you it's okay because this is example content it's here to serve as an example we've got some gangs there's some at the risk of like just patting myself on the back i like the name junkyard junkyard agenda as a gang that could be my like band name um bastiard hirelings so there are a few what i try to do is um there's no official like adjective for being from bastion i use a bastionese at certain times i use bastiard quite a lot and um i think there's another one that i've used i can't remember what it is now but I was going to make a concerned effort to use as many different ones as possible throughout the book just to show that there's no official word for somebody from Bastion. No one can agree on even that. But I like Bastiard so much that I ended up using it like it's used it a couple of times. For obvious reasons. It's just great. And once I realised I could use this, I, I, I got a little bit carried away and ended up using it a few times. Um so yeah how to make your um hirelings interesting uh, i kind of wish i hadn't used the word hirelings because it's very D and um they're referred to as servants earlier in the book but then servants are a subcategory of hireling here so it's all a little bit messy the cosmic angels so i am not going to uh, it, people have probably seen on twitter if they saw patrick stewart reading through the book um you may have seen 
that he was talking about some of the references that are in this book. Now, the cosmic angels are a reference to something. Um, if you can tell what they are, and the first person to mention it in the chat will win a shout out. Um, so there are 18 of these cosmic angels and they sort of fell from the sky and they're these sort of terrible huge beings and they have followers that dress like them and um, they have names such as Blue Titan who's like a big giant one and he's got some telepathy and there is uh, Grey Savage who is wears grey fur armour and he has fangs and heightened senses and there is um, Death in Waiting who has a poison gas gun and pale green chain armour with copper plates um, and they're all like super powerful I've, I've never used these of course I've not I, I wrote this as a as a sort of can I can I slip these references in to at the time into the odd and will it work um so yeah there's some silly references to something and i will move on and hopefully once the delay osotaki has nailed it yes they are the primarchs from warhammer 40,000. um so respectively they are sanguinius vulcan um ferris manus uh logar alfarius uh, Magnus, um, Rogel Dawn, uh, uh, Robert Gilliman, Lim Russ, Angron, Pedrabo, uh, that guy, <laughs> what's his name? Empress Children guy, um, Killer Bird, uh, Corv. Corv I, I always forget what that guy's called. The, the Raven Guard guy. Corvus Corax or whatever. He's like the lamest one. Um, Black Tiger is uh, the Khan. Thunderchild. No, Thunderchild is the Khan. Black Tiger is... What's what's his deal? Um, book of names of people that know too much. Limited... To, oh, the Lion. Ugh. Lionel Johnson. Uh, Death in Waiting is Mortarion. Warlord is Horus and Terror Ghost is uh, Night Hunter. Perfection. What's his name? Empress Children Guy. Fulgrim. There we go. So there we go. I think I've just. Uh, that's about the. Um, that's probably the second strangest reference to be in this book because Space Marines aren't exactly fitting in Electric Bastion. And, but the idea was you could hopefully find a place for any of your weird ideas so if you want to put your reskinned 40k primarchs in the game you can do it um i will explain prototype weapons shortly but the full sister judges is the other one that's a dumb reference um so as you can see here there are 12 of these uh, well there's 11 but don't get hung up on the number that's not really important um it took people a long time to work out what these were to the point that I think there probably aren't very good references. Um, but these are based on another set of characters from fiction. So, some Blanchful sister, the innocent, favours whoever appears most good by her naive view of the world, and she has a childlike manner. And then there are ten more. We'll come back to that. Prototype weapons. This is... This is the kind of thing that I... I'm glad I was able to put in this section, because it's the kind of thing that I do use in my home game. Um... But it's not something I would want to be a core rule because it is a little bit fiddly and it adds complexity to a game that is meant to be ultra simple in terms of the rules. Um, but I do, because I'm obviously very familiar with the rules, I feel pretty confident just slipping in something that's like makes it a little bit more complicated if it's if that complexity is mostly falling on me when I'm running the game. So things like having weapons that just do something fancy when you roll a certain number for the most part that's simple enough i'm happy to put that in there for myself but it is an option yeah in the in the thing i put use this i probably won't i don't use it all but i will put in the odd silly weapon as like treasure 
or in a shop somewhere. Um, cool. So full sister judges. No, no one's got it yet. Come on, we need to need to brush up. Um, I'm aware that we're making quite slow progress, but I think uh, how many how many pages we've got left? We're on three nineteen. I think there's three hundred forty pages. Yeah. Well, we we might pick the pace up a little bit because we're 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 coming on to an hour now, and I would like to get this one finished. Um, Augmentarium, yeah, this is just a useful little place for starting a game. Um, this was one of the things that I got to add in quite late on because what happened is I had the page count and I'd miscalculated. Obviously, with printing books, there's certain restrictions on the page count to do with, you know, you you can't have a book that's 51 pages long, obviously. But it also has to be kind of divisible by four or other weird numbers. I don't fully understand it. Um, and I ended up either having to cut. It was to do with the end papers. I'd miscalculated the way that they would work. So I had to either cut two pages or add six pages, I think it was. Um, so I decided to add six pages. So this this was a very last minute addition. But I think having a custom headwear table was worth the added work. So let me roll 2d20. Um, I will get 12 and 7. So the headwear is a bonnet and the uh, the detail is pin butterflies on a bonnet. Great. And you know, this is just a nice little little bit of flavor for Bastion. The Bureaucra Labyrinth was a stupid mini game that I wrote on the blog, but I thought I'll put it in there. It's not really something I'd recommend as a very fun Oh, there it is. There it is. Right, we found the offender. Let's let's zoom in. What's this here? Look. Ugh. Lose one will. So you can tell this was added late on because I obviously proofread it very quickly. And there is a reference to willpower in here that is what charisma used to be called in Into the Odd. But there might even be a couple of them in here. So if you are going to use this and you think, what is will? It's just willpower with a different name. No, it's, oh, oh, it's charisma with a different name. So, yeah, and out of all the typos that could have made it into the book, one of them being buried away at the end of the oddendum in this weird mini game thing that I don't really expect people to use, I'll, I'll take that. At least it's not on the front cover. Alien Dojos is perhaps the stupidest thing I've ever written. It's just like, can I make weird dexterity game mechanics work in the game so yeah you can like you sort of have games to do with balancing dice and stuff like that and it gives you more <laughs> causes more damage it's ridiculously silly but again this is example content you can do this if that's what you want odd marks are kind of interesting because it's it links back to the foreground growth thing so if you're looking for ideas for how monsters can change your characters, then this is a good place to look. Excuse me. And then we have the uh, example boroughs that were at least conceptualized by Kickstarter backers. So um, I won't go into them too much. There was an extremely unfortunate typo in this one. Um, the word gun there was a typo um, and it I am extremely grateful for somebody that caught that um, because that would have been quite unfortunate to have in a book that yeah I'll say no more um, see as we're getting towards the end if you do have any questions about the book now is time to get it in I've got I think one or two left from the Twitter thread but yeah these are your um, these are your sort of boroughs that I wrote for the Kickstarter backers that pledged at the highest level. Um, it's good that we got to have one in Bastion, one in Deep Country, and one in the Underground. And then, I love having this image here. The last word. This was 
only added when I realized I had these extra pages that I needed to fill. No, 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 it wasn't actually, sorry. This was to do with the end papers. So I was originally going to have, I knew I wanted to have this rules summary. So in the physical book, um, I won't get you a copy, but in the physical book, the rules summary is like on the inside of the back cover. And I knew that I wanted to have something like that there, but I managed to squash all of the rules really down into one page. And I'm very glad that was there. Um, but I didn't know what to put on this page. I was going to just get like some more artwork or something, or I thought about having a character sheet, but the idea of a character sheet on here is, um, is, is, is not, not really, not really appropriate for Electric Bastion Land, maybe. Um, but the last word, I have always tried to, um, show don't tell when it comes to sort of examples of what I think to be correct behavior in running a game or, or writing content for your game. So I, and I used to think that was enough and luckily I didn't, I've not had any bad experiences with people using Into the Odd or Electric Bastion Land to be harmful to other people or to write harmful things. Um, been lucky in that sense, but I thought it was worth putting something in writing because it's all well and good for me to say, well, I want to lead by example and I want to, I want to do the right thing, but not shout about it. It's sort of a, a philosophy I try and do. But I think when you're dealing with a setting that draws on the early 20th century, it does benefit from a little bit of clarity here. And looking back on this, I still don't know if I'm 100% happy with how I worded it. This I rewrote this so many times. But what I wanted to get across was the idea that this game hopefully has the potential to appeal to people that don't already play role-playing games. It's, it's very easy to learn. It's different to your typical fantasy or typical sci-fi. And I like typical fantasy and typical sci-fi. That's what got me into the game. I... I started playing Warhammer games because I I was drawn to the idea of orcs and swords and dragons and wizards. Um, but not everybody is. So <clears throat> I wanted it to be a game that other people that people who aren't into those sort of things might want to come and play. And I just wanted to make a statement to sort of make it clear that that's what I want to happen. And just because this draws on sort of old versions of D&D, &D, that doesn't mean that I want the table to look like it's the 1970s and the demographics and the demographics of what you would expect to see at a table in the 1970s. And just because I'm drawing on old school gaming stuff, I don't want that to be interpreted as me being old school in other elements, politically, let's say. Like, doesn't mean that I'm a traditionalist in any sense there. And just because the game draws from the 20th century doesn't mean that it's a celebration of things from the 20th century that aren't meant to be celebrated. And that doesn't mean that you can't have dark elements and you can't have, you know, horrifying things. But I want the table to be a warm and welcoming place. Because even though the world of Bastion Lang can be terrifying and can be unwelcoming and can be difficult, the game is not designed to be that way. And the table should not be that way either. Um, I think what really inspired me to write this was... Um, the team behind Morkborg, um, 
they have a statement on their website and I'm sure I'm going to get the phrase the exact phrase wrong but it's something to the effect of they write it's, it's horrible games not made by horrible people so their game is like based around like heavy metal and like black metal imagery and stuff um, but just because they're doing that doesn't mean that's what they that's how they want the table to feel they don't want it to feel oppressive and dark and unwelcoming anyway i'm not going to rant on about this i think it probably speaks for itself i'm gonna hide myself just in case people haven't seen this by the way um but yeah hopefully so, so far i've only heard positive responses to it um if i have somehow misspoken on here i'm hoping that people will at least understand my intention with this and my intention is to make people feel welcome and to just make clear that certain things that are simulated in the game doesn't mean that they are endorsed in the real world so with that out of the way i am shocked that nobody has got the second set of references so yes we have warhammer 40k primarchs but the full sister judges the one that gives it away for me but that might just be showing my age is you've got Arbissal full sister the sky watcher so she favors whoever embellishes their testimony with the most supernatural cosmic content she longs to become one of the star people and that she never shuts up about and she has the manner of an obsessed teenager um Chame 81 <laughs> you like to think that the last the last page number of 333 is a reference to something listen if i if i if i don't know how many pages are in the book like a week before it goes to print there's no way i'm organized enough to to make page numbers uh, line up uh, <laughs> sorry I, I'm, I'm afraid there's no meaning there um burial full sister the beast She's booksmarked, referencing obscure tomes to disprove any point made by either side. These are all judges, by the way, if I didn't explain that. Anyone that argues back against her is treated to a bestial outburst, followed by immediate and harsh, harsh prosecution. She has a snarky manner punctuated with animal noises. So, in case it's not clear, these are all Disney princesses. So, yes, in the same setting, we have... Sleeping Beauty existing alongside Lehman Russ and Kermit the Frog. There you go. So that is Electric Bastion Land. Fully deep dove. Now, let me see if I've got any more questions. There was at least one more question on the Twitter thread. In fact, it was a it's a ridiculous question for me to end on. So hopefully someone will end with a, a really in, 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 insightful question Sean F. Smith why is Beaker the best mockery listen I did say that they are Muppets mockeries are Muppets but they are clearly animal Muppets so when you're talking about Bunsen and Beaker and Bert and Ernie and the sort of semi-humanoid mockeries uh, Muppets rather I don't know if they've got a place in Bastion Land. I think you would need to animal them up slightly. So for Beaker, if you wanted to have him in there, I think you would need to make him some kind of bird or some kind of... It needs to be some kind of animal, definitely. And yeah, I, I did. Ha there are references to like mock people. They do exist. But for the most part, your mockeries are have some animal element about them. And that's kind of what makes them work to some extent. So that's Electric Bastion Land but um oh one last question uh catalessing this is a question that i get asked a lot and this is something i probably need to write the fact that i've been asked about it so many times suggests i should probably write something about it so i can just point um i know you mainly do one shots but have you experienced or know of longer games um i i've heard of people running the game for longer campaigns yeah um because this iteration of it is relatively new i don't think there have been many 
long, long campaigns. And I, I, I think you could do that. I kind of design for what I know. So I would have to do a little bit of research into how people have found it in long-term games. It can work for long games. It's definitely designed for shorter games, if that makes sense. So I'm not afraid of making the main thing for this short, short campaigns. And I quite like having a stopping point anyway. So I would probably not run it for longer than like six sessions, six sessions with the same group of characters. Um, but that is perhaps something I would need to write about because it's something that a lot of people are interested in. The idea of, does it work for long campaigns? But that is Electric Bastion Land. Um, and that is a deep dive. This has been an enjoyable experience. I've enjoyed going back through it all. Um, especially the artwork. It's been great fun to see all that uh, sort of with fresh eyes. And to go through it. Um, with all you lot here as well. The next thing I'm going to do next week because even though this is the last deep dive these bastion and broadcasts are going to continue for the time being i'm going to actually put some of this book to use so yeah i'm not done milking this cow yet i'm going to go to the um the running the game section and i'm going to uh go to bastion to begin with and next week I'm going to create a Borough of Bastion live on the stream and fill it with things. Um, sort of going through that process and just showing how I would prepare for a game um, of Electric Bastion and how I would create a Borough myself. Um, and then after that, I, I would like to do more actual plays, but I think they're going to be a separate thing to these broadcasts. Um, I'm not sure what comes after that, to be honest. Um, the natural thing to do would be to use, um, to create an area of deep country, to create an area of the underground. But I don't want to sort of repeat myself too much. So if there's something you would like to see on these streams, be sure to let me know on Twitter at Bastionand. If you want to read more about Electric Bastionand, you can go to bastionand.com. If you'd like to support me very generously, um, the Patreon, um, my, my Patreon pays for the blog posts um, that I put on Bastionland.com. So if you go to, I, I believe it's patreon.com slash Bastionland, but you can just search for Bastionland Patreon or go to patreon.com, uh, Bastionland.com and it's all there. Um, there is a Bastionland Discord server. These are all available on bastionland.com in the sidebar. There's a little bastionland bar where all of these places are available for you to visit. Um, but I would like to say thank you to everybody that's been here for these live broadcasts. It has been, it, it, I understand that a lot of people watch this on YouTube and that's probably how I would watch this, but it's been really enjoyable to do this with people interacting in the chat and it's been great fun. But uh, for now, this is Bastionland Broadcasting, signing off.